Uh, I want to talk about orchestration of microservices today. Um, quick poll, quick poll. Who is doing microservices already? Sure. Oh, oh, most of you. Who is doing SOA? Let's see if you have an overlap. Nobody. Oh, nobody. Oh, everybody is doing microservices. Awesome. Um, I actually don't go into the, uh, into the definition of microservices much, and I actually don't care too much if these are really like microservices, how big they are, if this is so, if these are just independent components. If you're doing DDD, it might be aggregates. If you're doing serverless, it might be functions or whatever it is. The, the basic idea here is, and what's important, is you have these kind of small like very autonomous things or, or services which normally have their own database, which normally have an own process, like an own Golang process, or it's probably a Java pre program or whatever it is. So it's very separated. Normally you have it a dedicated team caring about that, which is normally the reason why you're doing that, because you want to scale up the development. So that's the s setting where we are working in. And what you can see and what we already saw over a couple of customers is that if you, if you go down that route, you end up with quite a lot of services normally. And there, uh, the number of services is growing bigger and bigger. And the complexity shifts actually from developing like the single service, which gets far more easier, to how these services collaborate in order to do something useful. And that's what I basically want to talk about today. Um, this is a lot about communication, so these services need to communicate uh, with each other in order to do something. Um, if you're and it's remote communication, we are talking about distributed systems in a minute. And that means we basically have a couple of options to do this kind of communication. So the first one um, is like we're just doing like re request response, it could be REST, it could be gRPC, all these kind of things. Who is doing something like this? That's the majority of folks, I think. The, the other thing you normally do is might be messaging or might be eventing, like Kafka, RabbitMQ, or something like that. Who is doing that? Oh, it's half-half here. That's actually a good ratio. Normally, it's like 80-20. Um, and then, um, what's, so you see, it looks a bit, bit weird on the slide, so I made it at like a four-quadrant, which is probably not, not complete. But one thing which I think is important when you reason about these kind of things is that um, there are two things you have to separate. The first is if you're running like synchronous communication or asynchronous, and the other one is if you're blocking or non-blocking. So these are like the defaults what you normally use, but you can very well do like um, blocking asynchronous communication. If you're using Rabbit, for example, you have some, some call which blocks until you get the response message, and that's kind of a blocking way of using messaging. And I actually like to draw that on the slide because it, it emphasizes one point. If you're using like REST, for example, HTTP here, um, in a blocking manner, you're going over the TCP network with asynchronous again. So under the hood, it basically does the same thing. It's just very transparent for you. And obviously, you can also do, use like, like, uh, like gRPC callbacks or, or REST callbacks in order to, to work in a non-blocking manner with um, synchronous communication. But that's kind of a groundwork. And normally, what, what um, customers ask is something like, OK, um, these are a couple of these options, and, and what would be a good place to be? And I normally try to avoid to answer this question, basically, because it, it, it depends on so much factors. Um, I think the most important one very currently stands. So, so what's, what's the, the background you have? What do you already have in place? What you're familiar with? Um, which normally, so my experience is like 80% of the people are, are somewhere here, and it would be really hard for them to, to go something eventing because it's, it's a very different philosophy. So I try to keep out of that question, but um, when people really ask me, okay, what's your personal opinion? I, I, I like to quote actually a great quote from Todd Montgomery, Martin Thompson, and the go to. Uh, yeah, go to Chicago. They said, synchronous communication is a crystal math of distributed programming. And that goes like, um, I mean, if you're doing a REST call, it looks like a local method. You're, you're calling something, you're blocking, you get a response. It looks like a local method. It's so easy to do. And somehow we get the feeling there, there's much, much more complexity involved. But um, just this last time I do that. The next time I do better, but this is the last time I'm doing it. So I, I obviously have a tendency to think it's good um, for, for us as an industry to move downwards here, which I'm pretty happy if we were having half-half here. But um, the thing is what I wanted to talk about today is that independently what you de do here, you will have challenges, uh, especially in these communication things. And I basically want to talk about a couple of them, not all of them. There are quite a huge broad range of challenges you might have, a couple of them. And obviously, um, I can only like, 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 uh, draw in my, my uh, personal opinionated view on that. 
And therefore, it's important probably to know who I am. So my name is Ben Drücker, and I'm, I would say, kind of the state machine guy, a workflow engine guy. So I, working, uh, I, I work with workflow engines since uh, more or less 15 years. Um, for different customers, different industry, I committed to, to a couple of open source workflow engines. I wrote that lovely book over there. It's also available in English, or, or BPMN, which is an ISO standard for, for drawing these kind of workflow models. Um, so I'm pretty much in that workflow engine space. And that means whenever I see customers, they are normally kind of having these kind of workflow engine thinking, at least I bring that thinking to them. And that means um, I look at that today from a perspective, what I saw in the products and how these kind of state machines, basically, how state can help in order to, to, um, yeah, to solve a couple of these challenges. That's what I want to do today, actually. Um, that's only like, like, like one perspective you can have. So there are much more, but that's all we can do in 45 minutes. And um, I will, because I love code, so I, I, I don't like talks with the slides only, so I will we'll do code. We will look through a couple of um, uh, Go examples. And therefore, I have to use a tool. I use the, uh, an open source engine. It's from the company I co-founded, so that's kind of a coincidence. But if you're looking in the Go space, there's not much to find. There's, there's something from Uber, which is comparable. And there, there are a couple of other open source engines. If you talk to them by REST, they are also available from Go. So my, my point today is more like a conceptual thing, but I use, a, obviously, a framework. And that's called CB, CBIO. That's open source. So everything I do, you can do at home. Um, so that's my plan for today. If, if you don't like that, that would be the perfect moment to switch the talk. OK, awesome. Um, so let's, let's, let's do this. Um, so I start with the um, synchronous communication, um, like REST gRPC. That's the typical thing. Um, now we have remote communication. And this is the metaphor I normally use for distributed systems. I like that very much. I, I once learned it from, I think it was Jonas Bonnet from, from Lightband. And if you look at distributed systems or remote communication, there's the great paper from Peter Deutsch. You might know that, The Fallacies of Distributed Computing, pretty famous. And the first one, um, it's actually here, down there, where is it? Um, the network is reliable. That's a fallacy. It is not. Obviously, it is not. And that's why I use that picture. So the network is the, the ocean. The ocean is really, really rough. I mean, this is your application. That's probably your Go application. There, it's pretty nice. You have a heating. You probably have transaction management. It's pretty cool to be here. But as soon as you open the door, you have the rough network. And that's something you really have to care about. It's not abstracted from you. You have to care about it. I think Go programmers are kind of aware of that much more than, than other languages where you have a lot of abstraction around that. But it's important to keep in mind. So make an let's make an example. Um, let's assume I um, write a payment service. And let's assume that uses another upstream service for charging a credit card. That's hopefully imaginable. Um, if I do that with a remote communication, I have to think about the situation when the, when the network is not available. It might be a hiccup. It might be a longer outage. But um, for some reason, the network is no, not available. So the big question is, what do I do then? The first strategy, actually, is I ignore that problem. Um, I, it always reminds me, when I, I started programming, I, I have no exact idea when that was, like 11, 12, 13, something around that. And what I did at the very beginning is Visual Basic. You probably remember Visual Basic. It has one awesome construct. I, I never seen that in other languages. On error, resume next. If one line causes an error, just do the next line. Don't care. That's an awesome thing. Um, but I, I, <laughs> that's that's why um, what what how I always imagine ignorance. But actually, ignoring the problem can be a good strategy if if you're using it wisely. So um, I had a customer recently who said, "Okay, we have that one call which writes the statistics, and." We have a problem with that, like, like one or two calls normally a month, they, they don't go through and we don't write the statistics, but we have an easy reconciliation job, We're, uh, like running once a quarter, which is kind of okay for us. And then, okay, that's a good strategy, keep it. That's perfectly fine, you just have to think about it. So ignorance can be a strategy. What's most often used is actually rethrowing the error. And that's not a good strategy. That's really the worst strategy. Like, OK, hey, I have that network error. Um, here's, now it's your problem. Because what happens if you have these microservice architectures, let's, see, let's say the payment service gets that. Normally, you have another upstream service, like, for example, an order service or whatever it is. And that means um, you basically have these kind of cascading failures. And as soon as you imagine like a bigger microservice infrastructure, 
This leads to exactly these kind of um, big failures you try to avoid. So the, you should really um, put a lot of emphasis to keep that error like as local as possible. Because otherwise you end up with stuff like that. And um, that's from the United. That was a flight um, from, from New York back to Europe. And I give a couple of other talks. And these talks, I normally always have examples from um, checking in airlines. And I have a lot of exceptions from different airlines, error codes and these kind of things. That's awesome, actually. And I collected that. And since then, I'm always happy when I get these exceptions when I'm flying. So, um, but that's the best. Only United so far had a really uh, 500. That's really bad. That's really bad. Um, you shouldn't have that. So be responsive. As soon as you develop one service, think about this situation. Think about how to handle these kind of errors. Ignorance can be a strategy. Rethrowing, normally not. What could you do in that case? A, a typical strategy um, would be retrying. As soon as you do remote communication, normally you have retries. Um, retries are fine. The only thing um, you have to think about really hard um, something called idempotency. You probably are aware of idempotency. Um, idempotency means I can call it a couple of times and that doesn't matter. Um, the big question is um, why a zucchini? You probably cannot see the zucchini, right? It's pretty dark here. Um, it's a zucchini. And I, I, I searched for a good metaphor for idempotency for years. So if you have one, let me know. I'm really happy about that. Mine currently is a zucchini. Why? Because it's okay. eating zucchini is idempotent. I had a vegan time in my life before I got kids, like a couple of months I, I, I at vegan. And there you do pasta out of zucchinis, like noodles out of the zucchini with a special cutting machine. And the good thing is you can eat as much as you want. It doesn't matter. It's healthy. You don't grow fat. You can just, if you forgot, if you already eat, uh, have eaten your, your, your plate of zucchini, just eat another one. That's idempotency. Pasta is not. <laughs> good. Yeah, okay. It's, that's my metaphor. If you have a better one, let me know. I really would be happy. But it's so zucchini, I don't put it now. If you, if you have that with a credit card, um, if you just hand some, like, charge something, it's not item potent. If you have like a transaction ID, it's item potent because you can see, okay, I already charged that. I don't do it again. Very important. Item potency is really important, but it's a basic thing. Um, but still, it's worth to, think about, to, to talk about that a couple of minutes. Anyhow, we are still in a distributed system. So if we do retries, and the most retry implementation I see, they do a retry like immediately for a network hiccup. Oh, it didn't go through, try it again. Oh, no, do. So perfect. But um, you also have network outages. And we had a, a keynote today from, from somebody from Stripe. So imagine a situation where this credit card service is something like, like Stripe, really an external service from a company hosted somewhere. Um, so it's probably over like really the internet, and it's probably down for longer. So that's what we see a lot. And that means like directly retrying, it doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. And that's um, where um, a lot of customers start to use something what I call a stateful retry. And that means I can retry for um, not only like immediately, but like in a minute, or probably I have an increasing interval, then like five minutes, an hour, four hours, depending on the scenario. And that normally makes your service, again, much more robust. If you have like an API defined here where you say, okay, we do the payment for you, but give us like an hour and then we do it for sure. Even if you have network problems, you um, avoid these kind of cascading failures. It's a change in how you see the service. You probably fall back if you're H thinking in HTTP from like, I always get a 200 okay, I probably get a 202 um, accepted, so I talk to you later, these kind of things. That's why the synchronous communication of the crystal math. So if you prepare for that, um, you get a much stronger architecture here. So that's a stateful retry. Normally, if I propose something like stateful retry, the next question is like, um, OK, how we do that? That's state. State's somehow ugly. I mean, state handling. Um, we can do that, yeah, we have this persistent, I call it persistent thing normally. Um, it could be an entity, a database table, it could be a document in document store, it could be if you're probably not in Go, actors are not that fancy in Go, I think, but if you're using like Scala or stuff, you could do an actor um, in Akka or something like that, they can be persistent. So there, there are loads of possibilities to, to have something persistent. Um, but the problem is it's, it's quite a lot of effort because you have to do it. If you're running, for example, if you're moving towards serverless, um, 
having state, it's kind of a, a problem, so it's not that easy to have like stateful services as it is to have stateless services, so it's, it's quite some effort. And then if you want to do the retrying, you probably have to have a scheduler, um, you have to have probably operating, you have to see if there are errors um, popping up somewhere and these kind of things. So there are a lot of things you have to build around that. And that's why a lot of people actually are backing up, uh, backing off that and saying hot potato pattern, I, I just rethrow the arrow before I start doing all that stuff. And that's where um, these kind of workflow engines get in handy. That's what we currently do in a lot of scenarios which are really just about like synchronous communication in order to do retries. And I want to when I use that um, as an opportunity for some code the first time. So what I said earlier, you use CB, that's an open source product, CBIO, you find that yourself if you like. And how it works is um, you start up a broker, that's a workflow engine, let's say. Um, this is written in Java, so we, it's not like native Go, but it's Java, it's easy to start up, it can have it as a Docker image if you like. And then you have your application, and that could be like basically everything. So currently we are having a native Java and a native um, Go client, so I use the native Go client here. And then um, you define like a workflow model, and that's what I said earlier, we're using BPMN, it's an ISO standard, so it's kind of not a proprietary thing, it's pretty well known in the industry to define these kind of flows, like for example, I do something, and then I will show that in a minute, I can also define like things like retries, timeouts, and these kind of things. I define the model here, I deploy the model basically on the broker, the broker has to know it, and then I can run instances of that, and whenever I have something like do something, it's basically I publish, uh, I subscribe to that from my own application, so I have a handler, a callback handler in, in, in written in Go in this, in this case to do the work. So it's actually pretty easy. So um, how does that look like? Um, so what I have here, um, is that readable from the back? Awesome. Okay, so I have, this is the version um, which probably you all know, I, I do something like an HTTP server, I just have one endpoint, it's a very easy demo to be honest. I listen to that, and what does the endpoint do? Um, it basically reads some data from, from the um, request, then it charges the credit card, that does an upstream HTTP call. Hang on, hey, there we are and that basically does an HTTP post. So that's the thing you probably already, who has programmed something like this before? Okay, quite a lot of you. Um, so when I call that, and I have that running here, so I have, oh yeah, and I have like, I call it a Stripe fake service, so that's just an HTTP server which um, does that payment. I, I need that in order to shut it down whenever I wanna, wanna simulate a network error. And then I have this, so I say go run, um, Main go. Uh, yeah, thank you, Windows. Um, hang on a second. And then when I do do a call, it basically goes through. That's I, I do an upstream credit card payment. That's pretty boring. If I shut it down, what happens should be also pretty obvious. Like a test question. If you already have, if you're still awake after lunch, what happens? Oh come on, the upstream service is not available. I just shut it down. Obviously, yeah, we should get an exception, and that's uh, um, 500 in this case, because I haven't done anything about that. So that's what we want to avoid. And the next thing I go, I can do, I go in the next version here. So I change the main um, class. I still start the HTTP server. I still have the handler HTTP request. That didn't change, but what did I do? Um, I init something, I init um, basically um, a connection to the broker, so this is how it looks like. I just um, import um, the CB broker, I have a new client, um, nothing very fancy here actually, and then I register um, the callback. So I say I wanna, wanna do something, this is the method you should call um, whenever something is on the charge credit card topic. What's the charge credit card topic? There's the, uh, the workflow definition file within there, I can open that with a modeler, that's BPMN, that's how it looks like. And there, what you can see is whenever I have the so-called service task, I do something, and there um, I define, and we call it topic name. So there it says charge credit card should do that, and the charge credit card directly um, uh, relates to this. So this is how this is connected. 
Um, and then I can define like other things, like a retry strategy and these kind of things. So um, whenever this doesn't work, what should I do and these kind of things. Um, this basically ha have the callback. The callback basically then does the HTTP call, which I already had before, so this doesn't change much. There are a couple of things in order to read the data, which will get easier in the next version of the, of the Go client. We still have to mess around a bit, but it's not, not really complicated there. Um, and then I can say basically to the workflow engine, okay, this didn't work, or this did work. And then if it didn't work, it will retry and these kind of things. Um, and if it did work, it just moves on. And the only thing we have to check when we now handle the request and we charge the credit card, what I did change is now I don't do the HTTP call immediately, but I start a new workflow instance. So that's basically it. The code is on GitHub, so we can uh, just walk through that. Um, again, probably a bit slower. I know I talk pretty fast most of the time. Um, but I hope that gives you an impression of the level of complexity what you need. That's my, my goal here. So it's not very hard to do. And if I have this, um, the behavior changes. So um, let's start the, uh, hang on a second, the version 3. Let's go. Yes. Stripe service is still down. Um, now the behavior changes. Um, whenever I hit the send button, it's still not there. You see something is going on here. It retries the call. I haven't configured any delay, so it's just retrying the call immediately. Um, my HTTP got back um, like a, OK, it should be a 202, actually, to be, to be fair. I haven't hacked that, so it's a 200 OK. So everything fine here. Um, but the workflow um, hasn't yet called the payment. So what you can do in this kind of engines is now you have a state somewhere persistent, and you can even look into that. So for example, um, we have that simple monitor, it's called. Um, it's a very easy application at the moment just to look into the, to the engine. There you can see, OK, what kind of instances do I have? OK, this one was the last one. And then you see, OK, this one has an error in the charge credit card because we don't have retries left. And you, even could dive into more, more details. And depending on when, they, when the service will go up again, let's do this. Then you can also have like, yeah, like additional retries, either triggered automatically with a delay or um, even triggered manually. So we have customers also doing these kind of things after an outage of a service. They probably even like in a batch start retrying like even like uh, 500,000 of instances at once or these kind of things. So that's not a problem. So I retried that, and this time it went through, and we should see the charge on the credit card in the other service. So that's the basic idea here. And if you have these kind of things, um, oh no, we keep, yeah, we keep that. Um, you can even go further. So I have a second example also on GitHub. Don't go into too much detail here. Looks more or less the same, but I extended the workflow model. And this also means, this is again BPMN, ISO standard, so it starts here, it does the first service, it still does the second, like charging the credit card, but first it checks if you, the customer has already credit. And if it's then probably fully paid by his credit, then we don't charge the credit card. So that's also kind of a, these kind of workflow models, and I come back to why I'm showing you that in a minute. And if you run this, that's version 5. Don't think about too much why version, what's version 1, 2, and 4. It's on GitHub. Go, in, go run main. So, so I start this one. Come on. And now again, I'm doing a call. We get it here. We get the upstream service. And what you can see is I have a randomizer here. You probably, let's see if we get that on the screen. There's a remaining amount of five. Not sure if you can see that. Yeah, some, some are nodding. And I have a randomizer. So if I do that a couple of times, I, no remaining amount. So sometimes I have a remaining amount, sometimes not. So I can do that a couple of times. Ooh, 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 a lot of fun. Um, and then, for example, just to, to, to trigger imagination, um, what most of these tools have is kind of a way in order to also to, to um, look into these kind of statistics, like, OK, now we have one running instance. We have 20 already done. Um, how much of them went which way? How often did we have these kind of errors? Or for example here, so that's frequency numbers. 
and that's oh sorry, and that's duration. So how long did that take? Which in this case is really boring, but it could be like if it's a real remote service, it could be pretty interesting. And that means you get a lot of kind of uh, also data kind of knowledge out of these kind of things. Okay, so there's the GitHub URL. I also probably tweet about that later on, so that's easy to find. Um, if you look at these kind of architectures, and if you do that really on like, like remote REST calls, what a lot of people ask is the next thing, oh, a workflow engine for our REST calls. We do like millions of them. Does that really work? And um, that's the, the cool thing. So if you look at CB online, you will see that it's currently not yet released. A, we didn't yet release a 1.0. So we have another open source engine, which is pretty mature, but we rebuilt a new engine from scratch, and that's really based on um, a, lot of, uh, 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 a lot of concepts you have in distributed systems, which you probably know from tools like Kafka or Cassandra, in order to make things really scalable. So we really can scale the broker. Um, we don't need any, any database underneath. We are doing own um, event streaming on disk. Uh, we, we do consensus protocols, so we really have a linear scale there. Uh, we currently make tests on, on Amazon, and there you can easily run up to one or two or three million um, workflow instances a second. So that's, that's not the showstopper anymore, and you can obviously also scale up the clients, and you could have like different Go programs for the different pieces in that workflow model also in order to scale it up. So there are various things um, to do, and that works pretty well. And that's also um, yeah, what, what brings it to a level where you can use these kind of tools for also these kind of, let's say, low-tech problems. Because if I say workflow engine, most of the time people think of like, oh, you have this big business process like drawn on the wall, like this huge order process thingy. Um, but it could be like these tiny little flows, what I, what I showed you, which we are going at. And then state can help you to solve a couple of the challenges you have there. Yeah, and what I said, we, we, we did a couple of um, uh, measurements, and for example, this is the rate of events written per second, so we are more or less in the same league of uh, Apache Kafka, so just to give you an impression of scalability. And then what, what do people do with that? Um, customers, so we, we are going into the um, first pilot project with the big customers, um, and they either use that from within one microservice. So you could have like one microservice and say, okay, this, there I have a stateful problem, like retrying or probably like even something more complicated. Then I just use a workflow engine there. And then autonomy within microservice architectures, probably another service has also a state problem, but he solves it differently or he uses a different product. So that's fair. That's perfectly fine. So that's what a lot of people are doing. But we also see architectures where um, customers start to use this as kind of a work distribution, kind of a more central thing, um, which is, let's say, more unusual, especially if you're into that um, dump pipes, smart endpoints thinking. Um, but it's also very interesting to, to look at that um, from this perspective. OK, awesome. And we're using BPMN. That's what I said. That's actually the, it's pretty dark, right? You cannot see that. That's, that's a really good book. You should buy that. Um, but it's a, it's a BPMN, and that's an ISO standard. And I, I really love BPMN. And I'm currently, um, a lot of developers don't know BPMN. Who knows BPMN? That's like 20 people, probably. More of you should know BPMN. Why? It's a, it's a really good language. It's a really good language to express these kind of state machines. And it's really mature. So we worked on the BPMN standard for like over the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years. I worked with a couple of different languages. And a lot of this experience also is now in BPMN. So you can express a lot of problems in BPM. Pretty good. It's widespread worldwide. It's ISO standard. And it's easy to understand. And not only for developers like, um, who probably like JSON YAML files, but also for um, like operations people, which can normally look into these kind of things, or probably even business people look into these kind of things. OK, but don't want to, want to go too much into the tools. So back to the concepts. We are having that network error. We are having the payment and the credit card, right? You remember that, I hope. <laughs> awesome. Um, now we have that retrying, probably with the same machine workflow engine. Um, normally, what you still do is something like, when the retries doesn't work for a couple of, like, for a certain period of time, we give up, right? Makes sense. Um, 
Again, now we have to think about distributed systems. And one characteristic of distributed systems is that whenever you have a network call and you get a network error, you have no idea if you either have never reached the service provider, if you have reached him and then probably the, the process was, were killed or the machine got killed or whatever, or if it has processed your request and the response got lost. And that's actually independent if you're doing like gRPC or REST, um, or if you do messaging and don't get the response message. So you cannot differentiate these situations. You have no idea. And that means, especially if you're doing payment, it's probably not such a good idea just to raise like a payment field, but you probably have charged something. That's a bad situation to do. Customers don't like that to begin. And um, so that means you even have to think about cleaning up Cleaning up could be different things, like, for example, OK, um, I do a refund or I call a certain cleanup uh, method on the service or whatever it is. Um, but you have to do that. And again, you have to do it reliably, because think of the network. Whenever you call it, it might not be available. Because you, you, you tried to charge it, it was not available. This is why you ended up here. But now you have to make sure you didn't do it. And these kind of things, again, in some situations, ignorance might be OK, because you say, OK, that doesn't matter. For money, normally, it's, it's not. So you have to de really decide, make a cautious decision on the, on, the, um, on the case you have at the table. But it's important to have these, um, from my perspective, to have these kind of um, strategies in your mind. OK, awesome. So that was more about synchronous. Um, Communication. Let's move to the asynchronous. There's actually, it's a highlight there. You probably don't see that. Um, you have the same challenges actually there. And there, uh, especially if you're using Kafka, we're having a lot of customers currently using Kafka. And I'm also talking at the Kafka Summit later this year. Um, and what they normally have is that they have problems like, OK, we are now using this message system. Um, and we probably wait for an asynchronous response, but it's really hard for us to track if we get that, to track if something got lost, um, to, to do something about that if it wasn't done on the peer, because we have no idea what he does. We just send out the message and then it's gone, which is, for a lot of problems, not OK. And then again, you can do something like, like also timing. That's again state. You have to, to wait for, for some time. It might be five minutes, might be an hour, might be two days. That depends on the use case. But you have to wait some time. And if then nothing happens, if I don't get the response message, the acknowledge message, whatever it is, I have to do something else. But only then. And that's actually hard to program without having the state machine, without having the scheduler. These are kind of things which are really hard. And then you can even do more stuff. That's what I said. BPM is quite rich. Um, you can do something like, um, and this is a so-called non-interrupting timer. So this one interrupts the waiting. I, I just give up. I don't do it anymore. But this one doesn't interrupt. I do something um, in parallel and, and probably just, just retry it and this kind of thing. So it can do a lot of cool things there. You can, have, wait, you can wait for multiple messages, aggregation of messages. You say, OK, I need A, B, and C. And when I have all of them, I can move on. And if that doesn't happen within a certain time, I have to do something else. You can do um, like resequencing these enterprise integration patterns. You can do all of them which, which contain, contain state can be very well expressed with these kind of machines. And then, for example, what we do in CB, that's also pretty interesting. Um, we're buffering messages. So whenever you have an incoming message, um, you can define a time to live and say, OK, this message, um, if, it can, if it can be correlated to, to a process or if it can start a new workflow instance um, within like whatever two hours, then it's fine. Otherwise, we discard the message or we raise an incident or these kind of things. OK, cool. So these are communication challenges. That's one part of the story. Another part, and actually my favorite part, consistency challenges. As soon as you have multiple services, and you have that in all of these architectures, independent of communication, you have consistency challenges. Because if you have like two services, and um, what you don't have, you don't have transactions, asset transactions. They're gone in this world. Um, there were some attempts to do really um, distributed transactions, but at the moment, there's nothing what really works in real life. The best quote there is from Pat Helen, who said, grown ups don't use distributed transactions. And um, Pat Helen works at, uh, currently at Salesforce, was at Amazon, wrote a couple of good papers about that. And 
one very easy example, and that's a real-life example from a customer, a very big um, car rental agency. And they're doing all their, not all, but most of their uh, microservices currently in Go. And they use Kafka a lot. And they have basic problems such as whenever they consume a message from Kafka, do some business logic in a database, emit a message or an event that they did something, and then acknowledge the message from Kafka that they, um, that they did it, um, they cannot do that in one transaction. And that's, it's kind of a not that easy problem because now you have, I don't go through all of the possibilities, you can have different possibilities in which order you do the different things. But depending on what possibility you select, you have different problems. Either you lose a message, or you do things more than uh, once, or um, you probably emit events more than once, or you probably delay emitting an event. So there are a couple of problems with these kind of architectures, which might be OK for your use case. But what they did, not for all, but for some use cases, they did something which I see relatively often um, in this scenario. They write. They do something, some business logic in the database, and then they have an own table, which is called like events to send or something like that. So they write the event to send in the database. Now they have a transaction, a really asset transaction for that, committed. And then they have an own scheduler querying the database table in order to see what they have to send to Kafka. And that's, what the, that's one of the architects there, what he, what he tweeted uh, soon after, actually. So that's kind of, you build your own state machine with the kind of things. So that's not what you should do. You can solve also these kind of things with a very simple state machine where you say, okay, first do the business logic, that's transactional, that's done, and then the workflow engine makes sure that it events is emitted even if whatever the Kafka topic is not available or whatever it is. So get these kind of possibilities. The same, and that's even probably the bigger topic for consistency, if you have multiple services, independently of if you're calling them via messaging or via REST, if you have two of them, they will not form a transaction. You cannot roll it back. Whenever um, service B now raises a failure, you already have done that, and that's done. You cannot roll it back. So you have to apply different strategies, like, for example, if there's an error, you have to undo A. I actually try to make it the go way. So that's one of the things which really annoys me in Go, that you always have that if error, un not equals none. But anyhow, um, so you do an undo, which basically means you call another service to undo what you already did. That's not a rollback, but it's a semantical rollback. It's an undo there. And it's also known as compensation. BPMN would have own, own symbols for that, but I used the simple form here. Um, and it's also probably known as the saga pattern. Not sure if that somebody uh, rings a bell. That's a really important thing if you're in microservices. If you're in distributed systems, you have to think about consistency in such a way. You don't have distributed transactions. And that starts with the first REST call. Very important. Awesome. Um, let's spend like more or less three minutes, the last three or four minutes, on orchestration. I, I named the talk orchestration. And what I did now is I, I showed you basically a couple of different workflow models, um, which is normally always this kind of sequence thing. And that's orchestration. Whenever I say workflow engine state machine, that's kind of an orchestration. And if you look at the microservice community, um, they're not that much in favor of orchestration nowadays. That started with one article from Martin Fowler. Um, he once said, um, the microservice communi community favors an alternative approach, smart endpoints and dump pipes. That's very famous, and you probably know that. And then he said, OK, and then we are much in favor of choreographing things and not using some central orchestrator. Um, and actually, this article and everything that followed, that, that causes, like I think, a couple of hours discussion every week for me, because that kind of um, is what most people are really doing, like choreographing. And I make an example that get what I'm, or, or, or can follow me. Um, this is a customer, um, Zalando, you probably know them. They're active in the UK as well. They're shipping clothes and shoes and these kind of things. Um, pretty big. Um, they're um, running the order fulfillment process over our platform. That's why we know a lot of them, uh, a lot of what they do. And they had uh, talked about that at a meetup last year in Berlin, uh, orchestrating a highly scalable fulfillment process. 
And the slides I have are not what they are really doing, but it's related to what they are doing. And you can imagine it very simplified a bit like this. So if you have a checkout, a payment, inventory, and a shipment service, and if you do it in a choreographed approach, independently of communication, could be um, event-driven, could be messaging, could be REST, could be whatever, um, it normally means that I have some kind of peer-to-peer -peer communication. So either, so um, if I want to have the end-to-end -end process, like paying, shipping, um, and so on, I start with a checkout, for example, I buy something, and probably event driven would mean checkout said um, um, something is ordered and payment knows, oh, something is ordered, so I have to collect money. Or the other way around, if you're more like a request response, the checkout would probably call the payment. And then payment does its work and eventually knows, oh, when payment uh, did the work, I have to do something and so on and so forth. This is a choreographed approach because you don't have any central thing. Um, and the problem is, there are actually two problems with that, which I always see in these kind of architectures. The first is you have no idea about the process anymore. So you, you simply cannot see that. You, after a while, you have to dig through all the services, which calls what, or you have to have some really good tracing infrastructure to see what's going on there. So it's pretty hard to re-engineer the process, which normally means it's hard to change the process. And that's, um, I was pretty happy last year when Martin Fowler wrote another blog post where he also wrote about that. Because now people, all the people did these choreographed approaches and now you can see, okay, but the danger is that it's very easy to make nicely decoupled systems with event notification, for example, without realizing that you're losing sight of the larger scale flow. And that sets you in trouble. So that's a bad place to be. And Netflix, for example, also a good example. They also started um, the conductor. It's also a workflow engine, basically, a scalable one. Um, also probably interesting or worth to have a look at. Traditionally, some of these processes have been orchestrated in an ad hoc manner using a combination pub sub, rest calls, and so on and so forth. However, as the number of microservices grow and the complexity of the process increases, getting visibility into these distributed workflows become difficult. So that's a problem you will face. Um, so from my perspective, and, and you can make a very, very prominent example if you want to, want to change the order of something in the workflow, you say probably, oh, I fetch the goods before I wait for the payment because I want to, want to reserve this stuff or want a same-day delivery, want to be faster with shipping it. You have, I love that actually, this is a change you have to make. If you're doing REST calls, you have to change each and every service. If you're event-driven, you have to change three or four services. That's not what microservices are meant to be. You want to have them independently. That's not decoupled at all. So that's a problem. And the thing is, you have to extract that orchestration um, logic. Um, you don't have to have like what a lot of people think of when they say orchestration is some central whatever BPM workflow engine, which is kind of a huge monolithic thing somewhere. And that's not the case. That's the, 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 the error a lot of people made in the past. But you, you have just the own service for the orchestration logic for the order. And that might, it doesn't have to be, um, but that might leverage a workflow engine because it's, again, stateful because it's remote communication and you probably want to want to have some visibility. That's fair, but it doesn't have to be that way. And it's nothing central. And it's, I think it's, it's, and if, for example, the payment does something with, or, uh, with, with state, probably it has its own state machine, very different thing. So it's nothing like a monolithic workflow thing. Um, it's really distributed. Um, and that's an important thing. And that means you have to balance orchestration and choreography. Because depending on the situation, the, either the one or the other might be coupled or decoupled this thing. And then you can run the workflow engine either centralized or decentralized. That's a completely different story. Depending on the tool, that might be easier or harder, but it's a different story. So wrap up. Um, what I tried to, to, to make transparent, hopefully that worked a bit. Um, so every way of remote communication has some challenges. And some challenges require stateful components. You need to have some kind of state handling in there. And if you do then complex peer-to-peer -peer communication, that can lead to a lot of problems if you do it in a purely choreographed approach, so you have to balance that with orchestration. That's what I'm trying to get through. I hope that was kind of, um, kind of okay. If you have any questions, I'm here the whole day afterwards, so approach me, ask me anything. I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. So uh, thank you for coming.